Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. This is James Olfair here with you, and we are coming to you. This is December the 17th, 2017, and we are uh, glad you are with us. If you want to be part of the program, we'll tell you how to be part of the program. We'll be discussing some more information on Christmas, since that's the time of the year that uh, everyone is thinking about. But we are glad you're with us uh, this afternoon, and we're going to uh, give you that content information, how you can reach us. Uh, you can reach me at a word from the Lord at gmail.com. That is a word from the Lord at gmail.com. Or my cell number is 276-340-2653. And that's my personal cell number. If you want to uh, reach me and uh, ask a Bible question, we'll be glad to, to um, have a Bible discussion with you. Anytime that you are ready, we'll meet you. Um, we'll come to your home where you can meet me at a certain place. We'll be glad to, to accommodate you and all that in any way that we can. If you're looking for the truth, friends, we really want to study the Bible with you. And we hope that the things that we're saying and teaching cause you to open your Bibles and, and, and study. You know, we never ask people to uh, take our word for what we're saying. We never ask you to, you know, take it at face value. We say open the Bibles. Open your Bible. Get out your pen and paper. Jot down what is being said. And, um, you know, try it out for yourself. In Acts 17, verse 11, the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the Scriptures. And, uh, you know, they were testing to see if those things were so. And so we hope that you'll be the same way. And so uh, A Word from the Lord is a program that's brought to you by the Church of Christ. And... We want you to examine what the Bible is saying. And so we hope that you'll do that very thing. Today, as I said, today we're going to be uh, uh, discussing more on Christmas. and How can we celebrate Christmas or should we celebrate Christmas? Uh, but not as a religious practice such as the birth of Christ. Now that may seem like blasphemy to many. Because uh, either way you want to take that. Some people say, well, I can't believe you don't uh, celebrate Christmas as the birth of Christ. Well, I don't because the Bible doesn't say that. Other people say, I can't believe you would even remotely even talk about Christmas. You're a Christian. You shouldn't even uh, be associated at all with it. And so, uh, you know, what does the Bible tell us? Is, is there any instruction? Is there a word from the Lord on on this particular matter, how can how can you balance it out, or is there a, is there a, a balancing act between that? Can you do either um, of these things, or, or or how does it work? And so this is what what's going to be coming up uh, today on a word from the Lord. Let me give you the information uh, that uh, how you can uh, assemble with us. I didn't tell you where we meet. We meet at two fifty the Boulevard. The Church of Christ meets at two fifty the Boulevard in. Eden, North Carolina, and we meet on Sundays at 9 a.m. for class and 10 a.m. for worship and 7 p.m. on Thursdays for uh, Bible study, and it's just that, it's Bible study. We um, have, you know, it's a time when you can ask questions. If, you're, if you've got a question about something, we'll, we could take the whole time and just uh, answer that Bible question for you if it was something that... Uh, was really pressing, or if you didn't want to ask in that in that class, we would you know be glad to sit and take the time and study with you after the fact. Uh, we we've been going through the Book of Corinthians on Thursday nights at this time, but you know we're uh, more than happy to have a Bible study and and uh, we swap topics on occasion just to uh, uh, meet the needs of someone that has come in or has a Bible question, so we'll, we'll do the very thing, but a word, uh, a word from the Lord is brought to you by the Church of Christ in Eden, North Carolina, 250 the Boulevard is where we assemble, Sundays at 9 and 10 a.m. and then Thursdays at 7 p.m. If you want to be a part of the program, uh, friends, this is how you can call in to be part of the program. This is a live call-in program, so you can call in with your Bible questions right now, and we'll be glad to take your phone calls. The area code is 336. 336 is the area code, and then it's 427-9696, 427-9696, 427-WMYN, or 627-9563, 627-9563, that's W-L-O-E. 
627 W L O E. And so uh, those are the ways you can uh, call in on the program and be a, and participate in any way that you uh, uh, have a desire. Maybe you have a Bible question about something that we've said in the past, or maybe we're going to be going through this lesson and you have another question coming up, and so we'll be glad to uh, to uh, answer that question as well. And so uh, that's how you can be a part of the program, 427-9696 or 627-9563. Um, all right, so last week, last week we, <clears throat> excuse me, we looked at the birth of Christ, and we made the point that his birth was not the greatest part of the story ever told. We, we talked about the greatest stories ever told, and I think maybe that had been a movie, or there was a movie by that title. But the greatest story ever told was not just the birth of Christ. And we made the point we showed from the scriptures that if Christ hadn't, raised, hadn't been raised from the dead, if he hadn't died and been raised from the dead, no one would even known he'd been born. I mean, there wouldn't be anything special to look back and say, well, he must have had a a very special birth. He must have been born of a, a, a virgin. Because if he hadn't risen from the grave, he'd been like anybody else. And so, without the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, there would be no reason to even think about him being born of a virgin and having a special birth. And then we talked about, too, the fact that after his death, burial, and resurrection, um, the, the church that he established, he established the church, his church. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, Matthew 16, 18. And the gates of hell, or the gates of Hades, will not prevail against it, that thus indicating he was going to come up out of the grave. And so when people talk about the greatest story that was ever told, and they don't go ahead and tell you the connection between, or the connection to, his birth with the, his death and brown resurrection, and then the church that he established, they're not telling you the whole story. They're not giving you the rest of the story. And that's why the the greatest story, we said the greatest story that was seldom ever told because you certainly never hear uh, anything about the church being emphasized in the, in the denominational world. They'll tell you the church doesn't matter. So we know that the, uh, the greatest story that uh, should be told has to include the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as well as the church that he established. So why is it then this time of the year, do people put so much emphasis on his birth? I mean, why why do you drive down the road and you see uh, you see a, a a man and a woman and a baby out in the cold and and he's in a a manger and he's you know got three men uh, bringing him gifts and you got all the farm animals out there uh, around him and wh wh where does that picture come from? I mean, that, that picture is not in the Bible. There's so many things, for instance, so many things wrong with the picture that people have about Christmas that are not even in the Bible. I mean, uh, the fact that Christ was not even in, uh, uh, you know, he wasn't in a, a stable to start with, but he wasn't a babe when the uh, wise men came. Uh, when the wise men came to him, he was a he was a young child. Let's just um, I'm not really wanting to go this direction uh, today, but I just will point out some things that uh, that most people associate with the birth of Christ, and yet they miss it. In Matthew chapter two, see friends, here's here's the power of just reading the Bible instead of watching the movies, reading the Bible, listening to the Bible. Uh, not listening to what the preacher says. Don't let him embellish the story and add things to the story that's not there. Just listen to what the Bible has to say about it. In Matthew chapter 2, the Bible says, Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to, to Jerusalem. Now, let's stop. Number one, we don't know how many wise men there were. Uh, Might have been... Uh, two, might have been three, might have been seven, might have been ten, you know, I don't know, might have been a whole whole caravan of them. Uh, verse two, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard those heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. 
For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star had appeared. So the star had appeared to them at, at some point in time, and now they're just now getting to Judah. Uh, to you know, They're just now coming to Jerusalem or to Bethlehem. And he sent, uh, sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search diligently for the young child. Now, why was he calling him a young child? Why didn't he say the babe? Because he asked him what time the star appeared. And obviously they've, they've told him a time frame. And we're going to know what that time frame is as we read through the text. But Herod is not under any impression that it's necessarily a babe. He says a young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Uh, verse 9. This is Matthew 2, verse 9. And when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child, again, the young child, where the young child was, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, notice they came into the house. Uh, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Uh, and when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek to uh, seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were born in Bethlehem in all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Now, why did he kill every, every child two years old and under? Because, apparently, that's what the, 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 uh, the wise men taught him. Well, we saw the star about two years ago. So he's he's looking he's making sure he's going to make sure that he gets uh, that he kills this this child. So he starts from two years old and, and uh, under, but the fact that he kills two year olds tells you right there that the uh, uh, that Herod uh, understood that it is very very likely that that this child was two years old. So he wasn't a babe in the manger like everybody that you see up and down the road having Jesus out in the manger, you know, with the, with the camels and the sheep and the goat and the three wise men and, and, and everything. That's, that's not in the Bible. But how, does, how did we get that? Well, we get that because no one searches the Bible. No one looks to the Bible. And so uh, I'm just saying, friends, that's why, that's why when you look at the Bible, you start, really, you start to see, well, you know what, There's, maybe we're putting the emphasis in the wrong place. Uh, on the birth of Christ, and then even when we talk about the birth of Christ, we have so much wrong with the birth of Christ. And so, friends, let me just say this. If God had wanted us to remember the date of Christ's birth, he, he would have preserved it. He, he could have very easily preserved the date in which on which uh, his son was born. Now, let me just give you an example. How many times, just stop and think, if you've read your Bible through, most people have read their Bibles through, or at least they, they brag about that. I hear people a lot of times say, I've read the Bible 20 times, 30 times. Okay, well, great. Well, how many times in the Bible does God record months, days, and, and years for us? I mean, just think about that. Here's, a, here's an example. In Exodus chapter 12, here's Exodus chapter 12, this is the Passover. Now, this is when God actually starts the the Jewish calendar that it starts with the Passover. He says to them in Exodus twelve and verse one, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So their year was going to start in a certain month. Now he says verse three, speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month 
Ye shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of souls, every man according to his eating, shall you make your count for the lamb. Now notice, the lamb was to be a male of the first year without blemish, and you take it out of the sheep or from the goats. Verse 6, And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, here's my point. When it came to the Passover, God was very specific. And the Jews always kept the Passover. I mean, today, today, we know when the Passover would have been. All right? I mean, we, we, I mean that's just part of the calendar. It's on this, this month, all right, a certain month, which it falls on our, our calendar, uh, March and April, I think it's going to be, it's actually going to be April 1st in, in the, this coming year. But April 1st is going to be the Passover. And notice, God said, all right, this is, when, when the calendar, your calendar starts, it's going to be, you keep this lamb, uh, you take it on the 10th day, right, and you keep it till the 14th day. So here's my point, friends. When when we're keeping up with the Passover, well, I don't say we're keeping up with the Passover. I don't, I don't observe the Passover. I observe the Passover on the Passover. I pass it over. I don't I don't observe it at all. But uh, not like the Jews did. But here's my point. We, if we were going to keep it, we would know the exact month. We would know the exact day to do these things. God would have preserved for us the the month and the day that Christ was born if he'd wanted us to remember it. See how easy that is? I mean, no one stops to think, well, we don't know when Christ was born. We don't know what month it was. We don't know what day it was. But we're just gonna we're just gonna celebrate it on December twenty fifth. Why? I mean, don't you really want to? If you're gonna celebrate his birthday, why wouldn't God have said, "All right, on the twenty fifth of the twelfth month, you need to observe the birth of my son." He didn't say that. Why? Because it wasn't important to him. What was important was his death, burial, and resurrection. And if he had have wanted to preserve it, he would have preserved it. He would have preserved it, and that's why it was. It was easy to see when people uh, disobeyed what God said when it came to the Passover. In 1 Kings chapter 13, 1 Kings chapter 13, you have Jeroboam, and the Bible says Jeroboam uh, made two calves of gold and set them, uh, one in Bethel and one in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. Now notice, and this is 1 Kings 12 and verse 31. And he made, a high, he made a house of the high places and made priests of the lowest of the people which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So he did in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he made and placed in Bethel the high priest the high places uh, and he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart. So the uh, Israel was supposed to keep a, a feast in the seventh month and the fifteenth day. But Jeroboam comes along and says, we're going to have it on the eighth month and the fifteenth day. How would they know when that was unless they were keeping track of the months and the days? And my, my point in, in saying all this, friends, is simply this. If God had wanted us to keep up with his son's birth, he would have he would have specified the month and the day. He could have very easily specified the month and the day. But he didn't. He didn't. And so that's why uh, when we're talking about uh, the, the birth of Christ, it, it's just not important to remember the birth of Christ. It, well, is it important that he was born? Obviously, of course. Uh, if he hadn't been born, he never would have uh, lived and died for us. But again, we wouldn't have known that he lived uh, or was born of a virgin if he hadn't have lived, died, and been raised again. So 
if God can preserve specific months and dates uh, to keep a, a feast, then surely he, could have, he would have preserved the month and the date of his son's birth. Now, let me give you another thought here. If, his, if the birth of his son was so important, why is it only mentioned in two of the gospel accounts that tell us about the life of Christ? You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And of those four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the only two books that record anything about the birth of Christ is Matthew and Luke. And even Matthew doesn't really talk about the birth of Christ. I mean, if you, if you stop and read, if you notice in Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 1, uh, you get the genealogy of Christ uh, through the first 17 verses. And then verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And it really doesn't talk about the birth of Christ. It just talks about the things leading up to the birth of Christ. It's really more about Joseph and Mary uh, and their situation in uh, before the birth of Christ. It says, but while he thought uh, Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she came, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt uh, call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, uh, spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with a child, and shall raise forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So really, Matthew's account about the birth of Christ is not really about the birth of Christ. It just says, this is the things leading up to the birth of Christ. And then Joseph uh, didn't know Mary, you know, he, he, until she brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. And the next chapter... The next chapter is chapter 2, and what do we find? We find a two-year-old Jesus. So, I mean, not, not a whole lot of detail on the birth of Christ in Matthew. Luke is where you get all the details. Luke's uh, account is where you get all the details about Christ uh, being uh, born and uh, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger and no room for him in the inn and, and so forth like that. that. That's where you get all those details. So think about it this way, friends. If the birth of Christ was so important, why does only Luke really tell us all the details? I mean, someone might say, well, Luke's a doctor. You know, he, he, he probably delivered some babies before, so he, he, he's, he's got a, um, you know, a mindset to talk about all the details of delivering babies. Okay, fine. But Matthew doesn't really talk about it. Matthew just says it happened. When you start reading, when you go to the book of Mark, when you start in the book of Mark, uh, Mark, the Gospel of Mark starts off with John the Baptist crying in the wilderness. Boom, we, I mean, we skipped a whole 30 years of Christ's life. And the same thing with, with uh, the book of John. I mean, John starts off with uh, the word becoming flesh, but he pretty much starts off with John the Baptist too. So I'm saying all this, friends, to say this time of year, everybody's focused on the birth of Christ and they're going to forget him. <laughs> you know, they're going to forget him uh, when January rolls around. You know, the birth of Christ is going to be, well, that holiday's over and no one's going to think about him. So why spend so much time thinking about the, the, uh, uh, the birth of Christ when God doesn't even take the time to talk about the birth of Christ in all of the life accounts of Christ. I mean, he barely touches it in Matthew and he spends time in Luke, but he doesn't talk about it in Mark or John. So is the birth of Christ that important? I say not as important as the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You know why? Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record his death. They all record his death. 
burial and resurrection. They all talk about that. So, what's more important? See? The event, it, it tells me the event that we're supposed to remember is his death. That's what we're supposed to remember. In Luke uh, 22, Luke 22 and verse 19, Jesus himself said this, He took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. He didn't say have a birthday party celebration in my honor. He didn't, he didn't say have a national holiday to remember my birth. You know? That's what, that's what man comes up with. Have you ever thought about that, friend? This is man's wisdom. Man's wisdom is we want to celebrate, we want to commemorate some great person. So what do we do? Well, we'll name a holiday after him. We'll name a holiday after him. That's right. See, we got President's Day. Right, President's Day, pretty much all of February is President's President's Month. <clears throat> George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Ronald Reagan, thing all born in February. Uh, you know, we'll have a national holiday. We'll shut the country down. Stop doing everything. Have a big holiday to remember this person. Nope, not God. That does that's not the way God thinks. God says, "My, my, my thoughts are not your thoughts." My ways are not your ways. My ways are higher. My thoughts are better. Isaiah 55. So man says, let's shut the country down. Let's, have a, let's memorialize this person. Let's have a holiday after them. God says, no, not for my son. My son, you remember his death. Burial and resurrection, and you do it on the first day of every week, which is when Christians, New Testament Christians, saints, Members of the Church of Christ, that's when they observe the Lord's Supper and remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11, 24, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 24, if you're taking notes, this is what Paul said. Paul said, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after uh, in the same manner also he took the cup which he had supped, saying, "This cup is the new testament of my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come." Nothing about his birth, just his death, death, burial, resurrection. That's that's what the apostle Paul said that he got from Christ. Now, you know, if you're going to honor someone's wishes on being remembered, wouldn't you, wouldn't you do it the way they said do it? I mean, if someone said, this is what I want my memorial service to go. I mean, I've been a part of, I don't know how many funerals, you know, countless of funerals. And usually, <laughs> I mean, I've been a part of some that didn't do this, but usually the, the person who has, has been, is deceased, the departed usually has, you know, this is this is some wishes. This is what mama wanted. This is what daddy wanted. This is whatever. And those wishes are the ones that, that are followed. Now, like I said, I've been part of several that didn't do that. But you would think you would take into account the wishes of the departed. Well, here's Christ. Christ died. He says, this is how I want you to remember me. Nothing about his birth, but everything about his death. And so the only... The only important part of the birth of Christ is his birth from the grave. And I think we talked about this last week in Acts 13, 33. God said, as it is written in the Psalms, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. That's when he was raised from the dead, declared to be the son of God according to the spirit of power, uh, declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection uh, from the dead, Romans 1 and verse 4. So that's that's the most important a way to celebrate uh, the birth of Christ is to celebrate his death, his birth from the grave and his, and his death. So maybe you have some thoughts on this <clears throat> on Christmas. Maybe you want to take issue with that. Uh, that's fine. Give us a call. Here's the phone numbers, 336-427-9696, 427-WMYN, or 627-9563, 627-9563. That's 627-WLOE, and the area code there is 336. So give us a call, and uh, we'll continue discussing this.
Now, someone might say, well, James, how, how do you observe or celebrate a special day like Christmas or Easter or whatever that all the religious world uh, views as a Christian religion? You know, Christmas is a Christian holiday, so-called Christian holiday, or, or Easter is a Christian holiday. How, I mean, how do you... How do you participate in that but yet you're saying you're not like all the religious world around about you okay that's that's a good question and here's what you do you find out what does what does god say about the matter is there is there something that god has said on the matter that can tell me how i'm supposed to treat certain days that people celebrate or observe in certain ways Excuse me. In uh, Colossians two verse sixteen, start. Let's start here. In Colossians two verse sixteen, Paul says, "Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days." Now, here's what Paul's doing. Paul addresses the matter of Christians being forced to observe aspects of the law. Uh, in the in the first century. There were Judaizing teachers. That is, these are people that want that are wanting anybody that converted to Christianity. You had to go through the law of Moses first. You had you had to be circumcised according to the law, Acts fifteen. That's what they were binding on them. And so there was a there was a constant this this constant uh, uh, pressure to uh, convert people to Judaism before they became Christians. And Paul says, "Listen, <clears throat> don't let any man judge you." in meat or in drink or in respect to a holy day or a new moon or the Sabbath days. You, you, you don't have to participate in these things as religious observances. They, they've been nailed to the cross. If you back up just a few verses in Colossians 2, in verse 14, uh, the Bible, Paul, Paul has said to them, he said, You, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them, in it, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of holy days or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So he said those things under the old law, they were all looking forward, uh, pointing to, uh, to Christ coming. And so he says, you know, that they don't have to be observed as a religious function. So don't, don't let anyone uh, judge you in those matters. And so now we know they could be observed. We know the early Christians could observe these things, but they weren't binding I mean, they, they weren't binding. They, they weren't something that if you didn't do them, you didn't participate in them, it didn't mean that you weren't a Christian. Or, or if you did do them, you could do it with the understanding that, you know what, I know this is not really uh, essential or it's not really uh, binding to me today. Now, how do I know that? Well, I know that because, I mean, after Paul says this, Paul is saying, and if you read Acts 15, you'll know that Paul went through Paul went down to Jerusalem and they had this big discussion about do you have to uh, conform to the law of Moses in order to be a, a Christian? You know, do you have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses? And they said, no. You know, we're not, we're not going to bind this. We know that God has said don't bind this. And so we know that, excuse me, we know that it is not uh, essential to, uh, uh, to do those things. But if you did those things, that was not necessarily uh, wrong either. Now, and here, and here's how I know this. In Acts 21, in Acts 21, you have Paul coming to Jerusalem and uh, in verse uh, 17, and when we were come to Jerusalem, this is Acts 21, verse 17, when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly, and the day following, Paul went in uh, with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews 
there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Now that they they you know they don't want to give up their traditions of keeping the law, even though they're Christians, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest off all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither walk in the customs. Well, Paul didn't say that. Paul didn't tell Jews not don't circumcise your kids. He didn't say that. He he never would have said that. He would have said, you don't have to. You can if you want to. Don't if you don't. What is it therefore? This is verse 22. The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. And this is what they said. They said, we have four men which have, which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things where they are informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walks orderly and keeps the law. And so... So Paul does that. Paul goes and he he's at charges with these guys, which which basically when you're talking about uh, when they're saying uh, be at, at charge with them, be at charges with them, that's um, you you pay for the uh, the sacrifices or whatever. You're 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 the one that uh, let everybody see that you're participating in this, and so everybody's going to see that yeah, Paul really he keeps the law too. Well, Paul did it not because he was obligated to do it in order to be pleasing to God, but that he knew that, you know, this is this is just a ceremony. This is not really anything that I have to do, but I, I can do it. I'm at liberty to do it, and that's and that's what what uh, we should understand, friends, about holy days. I mean, that's that's where we get our word holiday. It's holy day. All right. And it just means a feast or a festival. And so this is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, look, you don't don't judge about certain days and don't let someone judge you about certain days. Now, you should make sure that when you are observing or not observing, that, that you're clear that, uh, you know, this is not uh, necessarily a religious practice for me. I'm not going to participate in such a way that would cause people to think that I am uh, disobeying God, but at the same time, I do have some liberty that I can do certain things in regard to a holy day or holiday or a feast that I don't have to give up. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14, here's what Paul says. Paul says, One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now, that word esteemeth, let, er, let one man esteemeth one day, that means to distinguish, to decide, or to prefer. So, here's the question. Do we have liberty to esteem one day over other days? Now, that's really what we're getting to. Do we have liberty to esteem or to decide to distinguish one day as preferred over another day? And just because you prefer one day or because you have esteemed one day that's special, does that mean that I have to? And just because I esteem one day, does that mean that you have to? Uh, can you? Can a person esteem or set aside a day, let's say a festive occasion, for a wedding. Well, surely they can. And you know what? When my anniversary rolls around, that's special to me, but uh, y'all probably don't think about it. It's not a national holiday, that's for sure. See? I mean, that's we, we esteem days all the time that are special to certain groups of people and people observe them, they celebrate them, and the rest of the people don't. That's all it is. We're, we're talking about we're setting aside a day. I mean, Jesus went to a wedding, right? In John chapter 2, Jesus went to a wedding and provided the refreshments. So it's, it's not like you can't have a, a day set aside for a special event or special in your mind for a certain thing. I mean, we set aside, we esteem or set aside a certain day for a person's birth, don't we? I mean, celebrate birthdays. 
I mean, that's what Job, Job, now Job didn't celebrate his birthday. I mean, when Job thought about his birthday, he, uh, he wasn't real happy at all. As a matter of fact, in Job 3, uh, Job chapter 3, the Bible says, Job opened his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which, I was, which it was said, There is a man child conceived. Well, he was in such misery, he said, you know, there's, there's no joy in celebrating my birth. But his children, if you back up to Job chapter 1, his children uh, were feasting every one his day. Job's sons, he had seven sons, three daughters. Uh, his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. So they were, they were having a birthday party. Now, does everybody celebrate the birthdays of everybody else? No. But now you might celebrate your birthday. You might celebrate your wife's birthday. You might celebrate your parents' birthday. You might celebrate anniversaries, you know, 50th anniversaries or whatever. Those are, those are great occasions. But my, here's my point. Every man can esteem certain days above others. And they have liberty to celebrate those days above others. But it doesn't mean that they're celebrating them uh, like everybody else. Um, I mean, just think about it. Think about this. We have some non-religious days that are esteemed, right? That are set aside, set apart. You got Labor Day, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, uh, you know, Veterans Day. Um, I'm just trying to think. You know, there's I mean, there's some great days that everybody ought to remember. You know, October the 11th, great day in history. 1969, great day in history. Uh, but I'm just saying th those are days that people can celebrate any way they want to. And here's my point: these are days that we use as feast days. So, should a Christian refrain from observing or participating in any of these days? You know, New Year's Day, New Year's Eve, you know, Valentine's Day. I don't know. That's you know, St. Patrick's Day. I mean, if you're if you're celebrating St. Patrick's Day, are you? Do you have to be a Catholic to celebrate St. Patrick's Day? Or if you celebrate St. Patrick's Day, or do something, have a St. Patrick's Day party, does that mean you're Catholic? I hope not, you know. I don't think so. And I don't think anybody that goes around wearing a green shamrock, you know, I, I don't think, oh, well, he must be a Catholic. You know, he's wearing green today. Please. See that? But that's where it started. That's where it started. And so when you're thinking about things like uh, Christmas, think about this, friends. Let's think about this. The reason why a person may or may not choose to celebrate Christmas or observe Christmas, uh, and they can observe it differently from the rest of the world, if I observe Christmas, I'm not doing it as the birth of Christ. I'm not celebrating the birth of Christ. I know what the Bible says about the birth of Christ, and I know what's more important. But does that mean that I have to then refrain from anything related to Christmas? Because that's because maybe the origin or how the majority of people are celebrating it uh, keeps me from from uh, observing this day. No, listen. Uh, people say, "Well, that was originated as a pagan holiday, so I, I don't observe it." Well, friends, have you ever stopped thinking about all the things in our society that are connected to pagan? Gods. I'm talking about false gods. Have you stopped thinking about that? I mean, here you got, what about Sunday? That's the day of the sun. Do you use that term? I, I mean, there may be some people that say first day of the week, but I, you know, most of the time people talk about what is the first day of the week, they'll say Sunday. They don't say first day. What about Monday? That's the day of the moon. We're giving the moon its day. 
Now, the Muslims may do that. They worship the moon god, Allah, but I, I don't know of anybody else that says Monday with the idea that, yeah, we're, we're, giving, this god, we're giving this day to the moon god. Our Tuesday, Tuesday is, is named for the god of uh, the Greeks. It was the god of Ares, and uh, Mars is the, is the Roman god. That was their day. Uh, Wooden, Wooden, that's Wednesday. Uh, Thor's Day, you know, named after the guy that carries around the big hammer that everybody goes and sees movies about. Wait, does that mean, <clears throat> you know, if we if we go to watch the the Avengers and this guy carrying this big hammer, does that mean that we're worshiping pagan gods? No. Friday, I mean, it's named after the Norse god of uh, Frigga. Saturday, Saturn's Day. You see what we're saying, friends? We have all kinds of things in our society that are connected to pagans, and we don't think anything about it. We don't, we don't have any notion that, yeah, when I say this, I'm giving tribute to a false god. Nope, sure don't. So why should Christmas be any different? If I say Merry Christmas, am I saying Happy Birthday, Jesus? No. When I say Merry Christmas, I'm just saying Merry Christmas. It's like I'd say Happy Thanksgiving. Or, you know, Happy Mother's Day or Happy Father's Day or whatever. I mean, if if a man gives flowers to his wife on Valentine's Day, does that mean he's worshiping Saint Valentine? If you I mean how many people go put gray put flowers on graves of loved ones? I mean, you think about it. I bet I bet majority of people listening to me are saying, you know what, I I have put flowers on someone's grave, or I've gone and I've seen people put flowers on graves, or I, you know, whatever. Well, are you engaging in the Hindu practice of placing food or something on the graves for deceased ancestors? Is it? I mean, that's where that came from, right? You're you're placing something on the grave for this departed person. Is that that's that's Rooted in Hinduism, is that are you doing that? No, see, no one thinks about that. I'm saying, that's not what I'm thinking. I'm not doing that. But what about you? Got to you got to get married in a church building. You know, friends, for a long time, I mean, there's people Protestants. When I say Protestant, I'm talking about everybody that's against Catholicism. You know that? Well, you got to get married in the church. Where did that start? Church wedding. You got to have a church wedding. That that's that's Catholic dogma. You know, Catholics teach that marriage is a church sacrament. Now, if you get married in a church building, does that mean you are converting to Catholicism? I hope not. See where it all starts? My point is we do things all the time that have a uh, that have a, a an origin maybe in some what pagan practice. But that doesn't mean that that's how we're celebrating it. So I'm saying that to say, uh, just because a day or a practice may have originally been used to celebrate or to honor a a god, or you know, a, Paul says a god that is no god. We know they're not really gods, but just because they're used in, to in in uh, or they were used to celebrate or honor this false god or a pagan deity or part of a pagan feast that does not mean that that still holds the same significance today uh, especially depending on how you participate in it now if I told you I don't celebrate the birth of Jesus on Christmas and you come over to my house and I got baby Jesus and angels and stars and everything else you say well James are you sure you don't look this as religious all day trust me you come to my house and there, there are no baby Jesuses, you know. We don't put an angel on top of our Christmas tree. Things like that. Uh, I mean, but now we can still celebrate and observe the holiday. We just don't put that religious significance on it. We make sure that, that that's not connected so that anybody sees it. Well, I mean, so, uh, you know, you can participate in a, a cultural custom and you have the liberty to do that. Uh, 
But now, I'm not going to partake in a religious practice that's not authorized in the Bible. I'm not going. I'm not going to have a. You know, we don't have in in the Lord's Church. We don't have Happy Birthday Jesus celebrations. We're not going to. We're not going to have these evening services, candlelight services, and katatas and cantanas or whatever they're called. I'm mean, not having all that. Why? That's not the Bible. I'm not going to celebrate the birth of Christ as religious uh, as religious celebration and let the world see that or think that that's the way I look at it when the Bible doesn't say to do that. So if you, if you come to worship with, with us, let's say next Sunday, you come to worship with us. Christmas Eve. Oh, yeah, you're in for a treat. Guess what you're going to hear? You're going to hear a good sermon. It won't be on the birth of Christ. See that? But it's going to be something you need to hear. And so, I mean, we can uh, we, we can uh, participate in things even though they had a certain origin but but not do it religiously. So that's why Paul says in, in Romans 4.15 that each person be fully persuaded that is convinced or assured. So, uh, you know, I'm certain. I'm certain that if if I say Merry Christmas, I, I can assure you it's not because I'm saying Happy Birthday Jesus. I, I know what's important in the life of Christ. And so that's why uh, that's why we can or we are we that's why we can do certain things or why we don't do certain other things. And so uh when it comes to religious practices, I mean we want to be fully persuaded. Now someone might say Say this, <clears throat> excuse me. Someone might say, "Well, James, what about the Christmas tree? Don't you don't you have a Christmas tree? Or didn't you ever have a Christmas tree? Yeah, sometimes we put up a Christmas tree. We didn't put up one this year, uh, just just because we didn't. <laughs> but here's the thing: Can I put up a Christmas tree? Someone says, "Well, what about Jeremiah ten? Well, let's look at Jeremiah ten for a minute." In Jeremiah 10, so you have to understand the context, friends. Jeremiah chapter 10, here's what the Bible says, and I'm, I'm running out of time. Let me give you our phone numbers one more time in case you want to call in here at the last. Uh, area code 336-427-9696, 427-WMYN, or 627-9563, 627-WLOE. Now someone's going to say, well, <clears throat> what about Jeremiah 10? Well, let's look at Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah 10, verse 1, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Uh, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus said the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cut of the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, and they fasten it with nails and hammers, with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. No, you have to carry them because they can't. Because they can't, they can't move themselves. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great. Now, here, here's what what God's saying. God's not saying don't put up a Christmas tree. He's saying the people around about you, they cut down a tree out of the forest and they make a graven image out of it. And he says, you don't do that. You don't be like, <clears throat> like they are. Uh, let's look and see what the Bible says in Isaiah 40. <clears throat> in Isaiah 40, verse 18. To whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? The workman melteth the graven image and the goldsmith spread it over with gold and cast the silver chains, so that it, so he that is so impoverished that he hath not no oblation, chooseth a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. So what were they doing? What God is talking about is preparing a graven image, preparing a graven image that will then. Uh, be used to take the place of him. 
Same thing Jeroboam did in, in 1 Kings 16. When he made golden calves and said, this is your gods. And God says, you don't be like the nations round about you that are cutting down these trees and you're shaving it to a, into a, a graven image and you're using that as your God. So friends, when someone puts a Christmas tree in their house, they're not saying that's their God. Or, now they might, but I'm saying, I don't do that. And I don't think I don't think the majority of people, anybody that puts a Christmas tree in their house and decorates it with lights and whatever are saying, this is our God. Yeah, we're going to bow down to this thing. No, no one says that. See that? I mean, when Jeremiah wrote this and Isaiah wrote this, they didn't have any idea. I mean, it wasn't even entered in God's mind that somebody's going to put up a tree and say, this is what we're talking about. So the Bible is its own best commentary, and the Bible will shed some light on these things. So, so no, uh, Jeremiah 10 is not talking about don't have a Christmas tree. If you don't want to have a Christmas tree, don't put one up. If you're allergic to it, fine. If you think it's too much of a mess, hey, fine, knock yourself out. If you want to put it up uh, in October, hey, knock yourself out. You know, if you want to leave it up all year long, fine. I mean, you have house plants, don't you? I mean, how many people have house plants? Have plants in their house, and no one says anything about that, but you bring another plant in, a tree, and everybody, oh, oh well, yeah, you, you, you're worshiping idols. No friends. You see, it all gets back to how do you esteem days? How do you, uh, what, what, are you what are you practicing? And uh, how are you esteeming certain days above other, of other, other days? Uh, esteeming certain days over other days. So friends, can a Christian celebrate Christmas? Well, not celebrate Christmas as the birth of Christ because the Bible doesn't command that. But can a, can a Christian celebrate Christmas or observe a, or participate in a, a, a cultural custom that they have liberty to participate in because it's not worshiping a false god, it's not doing anything sinful? Sure, knock yourself out. See, and so, but knowing where to draw the line, that's the key. Knowing how to esteem and what to esteem and knowing what really what's important. So Christmas, I mean, what, what's the most important thing about Christmas? I, I don't see the holiday. I, I think, you know, there's a lot of people that don't even believe in, believe in God and boy, they love Christmas. They love getting off, don't they? They love that Christmas bonus. They love... They love getting off, uh, off off of work and all the Christmas bonuses and all the specials, and they go out Black Friday shopping and and uh, Cyber Monday shopping and everything. So, friends, that there's the key. And so the the bottom line is always make sure that you're getting a word from the Lord and you know what the, what the answer is. So I'm out of time. Uh, if you want to reach me, two seven six three four zero two six five three. A word from the Lord at gmail.com, and we assemble on at two fifty the Boulevard. Sundays at 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and Thursdays at 7 p.m. for Bible study. Come visit with us, and you will always get a word from the Lord. Thanks for listening. Have a good night.